All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, let's just start uh, first with some intros. My name is Jorge. Um, I do some things at Sestake. I call myself a container gamer. Uh, I have the, the privilege of, or the opportunity to play with a lot of container technologies and then show that to people like we are doing here today. So um, you can find a lot of things on, on my GitHub or on Twitter. Uh, I have an experience mostly on, on monitoring and open source. Uh, so that's a little bit of the background uh, for me for having here today. Um, how many people here are using Kubernetes? Can you please raise hands? OK, cool. And how many of you are uh, using any CI-CD pipeline? OK, yeah, more people using uh, CI-CD than Kubernetes. That's cool. So let's first explain in a little bit the basics. Uh, this is not a generic CI-CD pipeline. This is not going to be a generic continuous security talk. Uh, we are going to take those concepts as a baselining. And we are going to see how using containers modifies the standard procedures for those operations. So let's just start understanding first what's continuing integration. Continuing integration basically means that we take our software, we build it, and we publish it. So it's ready to be deployed. Uh, but when doing this with Docker, there are some special par particularities. Probably most of you, you're using either GitHub or at least some uh, software versioning system. So you develop, you push your code into the repository. Maybe you have some branching policies, things like that. We'll see that later. But hopefully, in an automated way, something triggers a build of that software. Um, when using containers, typically those builds happen inside the container because of multiple benefits. And hopefully you're already using the multi-stage uh, feature of Docker that allows basically to have two different images, one for the building process. So you install all the building libraries there and then you generate another image just with the runtime dependencies. So the final image is way smaller. And then you push that into a Docker registry. So you can do Docker pull and then Docker run, and everything works. So this is uh, CI uh, with Docker, uh, just some changes. But what about the other CD, continuous delivery? Well, continuous delivery, or actually, uh, we can say continuous deployment as well. The idea is that we have built these images, but now we are going to do some testing, hopefully automate it where we test functionality, where we test bugs, where hopefully we also test performance. We've, we move that into that staging area through uh, doing all those tests, and then we move into production. If that uh, deployment is uh, fully automated, we call it complete, uh, continuous deployment. If not, it's still uh, more or less cool. It's called continuous delivery. Uh, these pipelines, as you know, uh, they are very, very different uh, depending on the workflows and procedures of your organization. But if we had to take an example of how to implement this with a Kubernetes, I have taken this uh, from the Google documentation page uh, when using Google Container Engine. But the idea is that your developers, they push the code to the repositories. They also uh, push the code to the development environment. And you have some building entities, Jenkins or whatever the software is that you are using that takes the code, builds it, it pushes into a registry, and hopefully uh, Jenkins as well, or in a manual way, we push that into production. Very simple, uh, just we put a layer, a new layer, which is the orchestration layer. But what about security? Um, first of all, we need to understand what do, you, do we mean with security. Um, I have tried to summarize what we uh, mean with security in these uh, five points. So the first of all, with security, we want to establish trust boundaries. So we want to understand who has access to dev, who has access to prod, uh, what kind of images I trust in one environment, in the other one. Number two, 
So, so basically, you know what you run. Number two is you want to identify, minimize, and harder attack surfaces. And this is something that goes aligned with microservices. The small uh, microservices, the small pieces of code, they, they just run one function. They have the minimal uh, access requirements. So it's quite convenient to use microservices to achieve this goal. Uh, reduce the scope and access. Very similar. Uh, those microservices, we can apply different policies that they say, OK, so I will access only this other microservice, or I will access this only database. And then fourth point, protections and defenses. So from firewalls uh, to uh, encryption, best practices, coding with security, all that. And fifth point, trustability and testing. So this is not something you do once and forget. It's part of the pipeline, what, which is what we are going to discuss today. Uh, the problem with, uh, with security is that probably your organization has started to adopt DevOps. Uh, basically, you want your processes to be more agile, your releases to be faster, uh, everyone wants to be happier. But then the security comes, security team comes, and they say, hey, hey, hold on. We want less incidents. So let's be slow. Let's be careful. Uh, we need to verify everything. So how you can accommodate these two philosophies into an efficient way? Basically, the same way you have modernized your procedures to adopt DevOps, uh, you also need to modify your DevOps procedures to bring security as part of the process. And, if, and because you still want to be agile, you still want to be fast, security, the same way that we have done with infrastructure, needs to be implemented as code when possible, which is going to be a few things uh, of what we will see today. And depending on how strict we want to be, we will decide, OK, if something fails from that code, I will open an issue, and I'll fix it in the future. If we are very relaxed about security, or if we are very strict, we can say, hey, we'll break the build. Uh, this is an on-go. We cannot continue. So how we do this with containers? Uh, basically, containers means new way of managing your infrastructure, new layers, new risks. But the attacks. Uh, they are no new, they are basically modifications of things that we have seen before. Thus, isolation breakouts, which is the most typical thing on containers, and those typical web attacks where you can do SQL injection, remote command in injection, uh, remote code injection, they are still uh, present on containers. It has not changed anything. If, you're, if you have already implemented a CI CD pipeline, you maybe have a skip security, but you, could, you should see this as an opportunity. Because on a pipeline, you have multiple steps. So you go from this stage into this other stage and into this new other stage. A pipeline is just a steps, a number of steps, one after each other. And security, it's implemented applying layers of security on top of other layers. So the more steps, the more layers that your a security onion can have. So this is really an opportunity to improve your, your security. And if you do it in an automated way, it shouldn't be very painful. So I have identified three areas where we can implement security across your pipeline. At build time, at shipment, and then on runtime. And I'll focus more on the last one, but I want to cover the three of them. When doing build, uh, this shouldn't be very different from non-containerized -contain applications. We can do code analysis, looking for specific vulnerabilities in our code. We can look for licensing issues if you are a big organization. We can even look for styling uh, uh, non-compliance. This is typically uh, uh, implemented as hooks in your Git or in your uh, software repository. You probably have branch policies where you cannot commit directly to master. You need to create a branch and then a pull request. And then to merge that pull request, you need to go through a number of set, uh, uh, tests. That's, that's already uh, security in your pipeline. We can go a step farther. Uh, some very security-obsessed organizations, they implement test-driven security. 
In the same way you do unit tests, you do test driven security tests. So you test your code against those units, or you develop your code against those units. But this is not different from traditional development. Uh, there are some tools that they can be integrated at this stage that they r run automated um, security attacks against your code. One uh, is, uh, or the most popular one, it's probably uh, the Thab scanning tool from OWASP, uh, but there are uh, a few of them, like organizations like Mozilla and Uber, they, they are using this tool at this stage. Uh, but now, because we are using containers, uh, we are not just developing the software, we are having uh, the packaging of the software together with the code. So we need to build the container. And here are a few things that are different. Number one, we need to use a base image. So we can use someone, uh, an image that someone built, uh, taken manually from Debian or Ubuntu, whatever. Uh, it's our choice, but we need to trust that image. If we take whatever we find first in Docker Hub uh, as a base image, it's probably a very, very poor start. And then we need to follow the standard procedures when building containers. Restrict the functionality. So we are not going to put multiple processes, multiple elements inside a container. That breaks the Docker philosophy. Let's make that simple so it can hopefully be part of a microservices application. Let's try to put the minimal number of dependencies, libraries, components inside that Docker image. So we make it small, but also uh, it's, it has less uh, attack vector. Multi-stage builds, it's awesome for this. And then we should restrict privileges of our container. It's definitely a very bad idea to run applications as a thread inside Docker. Docker containers, it's not VMs. Um, their level of isolation, it's not the same. Uh, the moment you, you can break out uh, a container, if you are root, you're already root on the host. So please don't, root, don't run your applications as root. And then try to avoid other um, special privileges, like privileged container, access to the host uh, process list, or privileged mounts. If your application doesn't need those, uh, or actually build your application so it doesn't need those special privileges. Finally, the third part of the, of the build stage is going to be probably the container scanning. This is one of the most popular security measures in, in a CI CD pipeline. The idea is finding known vulnerabilities, and this is very important, known vulnerabilities inside your Docker images. Probably the, you can do this on multiple, uh, in multiple places. Like you can scan an external registry, uh, you can do it directly on the developer laptop, but probably the best way is to implement this directly inside your pipeline. So you build the image, and then when you are going to push it into the registry, which is the software component that hosts your images, you will do the scan. And if that scan detects any critical issue for you, because obviously you can configure that, you shouldn't push that image into your repository. There are a few options. Uh, on today's talk, I'm just going to mention open source tools. Um, uh, Claire is probably the most popular one. Uh, was built by CoreOS. The Red Hat people, they also have something called OpenSCAP, which is very governmental, enterprise-y, and complex. Um, a new project, uh, and uh, probably becoming quite popular in the future, is Bulls IO. Uh, although it doesn't work really great with containers, but it can do. And there are, there are a bunch of different uh, commercial options as well. Um, let's focus a little bit on how Claire works. The idea is, as I said, during your CI process, you build your container, you push that into a temporal repository, or maybe you have a small tool that can scan it directly or can scan it remotely from that registry. The idea is that Claire, using its API and some tools around, can get that image, scan all the components, and then trigger some alerts. The source of vulnerabilities that Claire uses are um, security trackers for, from three different uh, 
Linux di distributions, the Debian, the Ubuntu, and the Red Hat. Everything is stored into a Postgres SQL, and you can have a few different tools to, to define how you interact with, with Claire. The idea is we are going to look uh, at the beginning for package lists. So imagine you do, I don't know, RPM uh, list or Debian packages list, and then you check the version of the packages. That's not 100% uh, accurate because that list can be temporary or because uh, you might be installing software uh, out of packages in your Docker file if you are using pip, rake, or, or go get. You might have a static binaries. So there, there are some other um, more advanced uh, methods for looking for vulnerabilities. Uh, you can look for hash, hashes of um, libraries or binaries that they have known vulnerabilities. You can even look for lost credentials that they went into the container images by accident. Um, there are as I said, multiple ways of looking at these vulnerabilities inside uh, the containers. And actually, this can be a quite efficient process thanks to the way that Docker images work. They are implemented through multiple layers. So you take, basically, you take the base image, which is actually just a turbo, and then as you make modification from base image, blah, 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 basically those modifications are a diff. Uh, inside of the, uh, inside that tarball. So the idea is that if you scan the base image, looks good, but then you scan another image, all the children, uh, if that base uh, image or that middle image has a vulnerability, automatically they will be identified as vulnerable. So this is quite efficient. How we implement this inside our pipeline? Well, whether you are Jenkins or any other uh, CI CD tool. The idea is that you build the image, you scan it, uh, you have two options using uh, Clear, either Clear or Clear Scanner are the most popular ones. And if there are no uh, problems, basically you look, if it's not exit zero, you push into the registry, you do Docker push. It's like five lines uh, script, uh, nothing very complex. Obviously, then you can configure which are, you can blacklist vulnerabilities, you can whitelist vulnerabilities, you can decide if vulnerabilities with a higher priority than this, they block the, the push. That is something that you can configure according to the requirements of your organization. But um, we have seen that this uh, security measure is quite popular and quite easy at the same time because probably if you're using a registry, it has already implemented this. Docker Hub implements this. Quay.io from CoreOS implements this. And if you're using a registry from many of the most popular cloud providers, they are already doing this. So even if you don't have a CI CD CS process, probably you are already doing that. OK, cool. So we have built our image. Um, now let's put or let's move that image into our production uh, servers, the shipment. Uh, there is uh, not many things that we can do here, but there are two very important. Number one is trust. Basically, that image that we build, uh, we need to uh, keep the, the change of trust from the build time until the runtime on the production servers. Um, it might be surprising, but this is actually disabled by default in most Docker environments at the moment. Um, it's tricky because uh, Docker started as a development tool, so developers, they used to build the images in their laptops and then push it into a registry, and there was no process at all for um, public, private key management. The idea is basically you need to generate a GPT key, you build the image, you uh, sign the image with that key, and then when you do the Docker run, if you, that image is not properly signed, will won't run. You can enable this on Docker with that environment variable. Uh, it's probably a good idea to do it. Just make sure you don't lose the keys, otherwise you're a screw. If you start doing this and you push your images into Docker Hub, uh, probably you need to contact Docker support uh, in order to restore the repository if you lose the key. So it's a good idea, but requires some processes. The other uh, 
uh, thing that we should implement at this stage is restriction. Typically, we just push uh, images into Docker Hub and we don't care, maybe because it's open source and maybe because we have already put the process to separate all the credentials out of uh, that image. But be very, very careful if you build images with your own code, you don't end up pushing those into a public registry. Please set up some authentication if you are using registries, because we have seen many people pushing code that they shouldn't be publishing into public repositories. And now let's go into runtime. Runtime is uh, very interesting because, um, well, CICD typically ends at the deployment time. Uh, it says continuous deployment. Uh, on the monitoring side of things, on the operations uh, side of things, we have already seen uh, people saying, well, we should incorporate our monitoring as part of our pipeline. We have seen people committing dashboards as code, committing alerts as code, even instrumenting backups or things like that. Why shouldn't do the same? we shouldn't do the same with the security? So this is going to be uh, the runtime part. There are, I have uh, split this in two parts, uh, the deployment uh, part, and then uh, the deployment of the infrastructure, and then the deployment of the applications. Uh, when doing the deployment of the infrastructure, we need to look are the new layers here. Probably we have already our procedures for standard Linux security, but we need to look at the whole security, at the Docker engine security, and then on the Kubernetes security. There, are, there is like configuration flags we should enable to enable authentication, to enable certificates, to enable all those security configuration flags. There are two very cool projects that they basically check for us if we are doing or if we are following the best practices. You probably know uh, the Docker Thys benchmark that compiles all these best practices. And actually, Docker has uh, implemented a set of scripts that you can actually run as a container. It's called Docker Bench that will check each of your hosts uh, for all these best practices. The same thing exists for Kubernetes. It's called uh, Kubebench, uh, and there is the, the following documentation, the Kubernetes benchmark. benchmark. You do this, uh, uh, my recommendation is don't do it once and forget. This should be a process that should be run as a cron job or with a security tool, and then keep an eye, it doesn't change. But then we have the new layers, Kubernetes in this case. Um, and we already see that more and more security features, they are making its way into Kubernetes. And as we are handling our deployment uh, with manifests that hopefully we are storing in a, Git, uh, in, in a Git repository. We treat them as code and we deploy them probably with Helm um, uh, charts. Uh, all these security measures, they can be implemented in the same workflow that we develop our code. Uh, probably one of the most interesting features uh, um, that people, they have a struggle a little bit is the permissions inside Kubernetes. This is called airbag. Uh, very quickly, three concepts or five concepts you need to understand on, on airbag. Namespaces are the different areas where you apply the different permissions. So a namespace is basically a, an area inside of Kubernetes where you are going to apply some security restrictions. Subjects, it's the people who uh, owns uh, those privileges. Can either be users, as the developers or the operation people interact with the cluster, or service accounts. A pod, a container, needs to have its own privileges for accessing components inside a Kubernetes to accessing uh, the Kubernetes API. The resources are the object. Uh, everything that can be uh, modified, managed inside Kubernetes. Can be a node, can be a uh, pod, can be a deployment. Role and cluster role uh, are basically the actions that we can do. If we can list the number of pods, watch for new uh, deployments, get update, all the different actions. And then the bindings is how a subject gets privileges to operate over a, resor over, over a resource. Okay? 
Very quick example, uh, this is long, I just want to see, uh, I just want to show you how you can define a role that can do get, watch, and list, and then you can define users that they have uh, the roles, okay? Uh, I don't need you to learn this now, just to, to see an example of how you treat these configurations, these permissions as code. But we can go uh, one step farther, and because Kubernetes at the end is basically telling Kubelet how the Docker engine needs to instrument, needs to create the containers, there are quite a few things we can do there. And some of the security measures that they have Im implemented at the Docker level can be managed as code within Kubernetes. And we have admissions controllers for that. An admission controller is basically a hook that we have in the deployment workflow when we have already authenticated and we have been authorized to do an operation. Before that operation gets done, we have the, poly the possibility to define some additional actions, like deny escalating uh, X. Basically, uh, you don't allow someone to uh, execute a terminal into a privileged container. No restrictions, so some, uh, the kubelet only can access the pods in the node where uh, it's being executed. And probably the most interesting one is the pod security policy. We are going to use this uh, uh, special configuration to define how our containers behave. There are many, many different options. You can use this to define in your deployments, in your pod manifests, what are the security uh, capabilities, what are the security options of your containers. If the container is privileged, if it can access the host uh, process uh, ID table, the host network, if we force the container to be run as a different user, which uh, volumes can access, and then, very important, the capabilities. If you know Linux capabilities, they are like a collection of groups of privileges of what processes can do. Uh, this is a very cool thing. This is a very easy way to restrict what the processes inside the container can do. We can go one step further and apply different Linux, a Parmor, or SecCom policies to your pods. I'll show you in a sec how, how that works. And then it's just a matter of applying these labels, these attributes to your pods. We also need to uh, define resource management because uh, having a denial of service attack, uh, having a, a, a container to use all the, your resources is going to be a security incident. That's super easy with, with Kubernetes. And there is many more things we can do. We can apply firewalling using network policies. Uh, it's coming very soon in the next version, an audit system inside Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes can handle TLS certificates everywhere, basically, for the API, for the services. So. Basically, we can see that Kubernetes can be part or can be a big part of our continuous security part. But can we go beyond this? Okay, so we have built the image, we have shipped the image, we have deployed the image with all the security best practices. Can we go farther? Can we uh, look at how the image or how the container and the processes inside behave at runtime? We need to look at threat detection. We need to look at what's doing over the network. If it's tried to escalate privileges or break out out of the container, and very important step, something that many, many people forget. How we are going to handle post-mortem analysis and forensics if Kubernetes kills our container? Imagine you get hacked and then Kubernetes decides, oh, let's kill the containers, and because I'm going to risk schedule this container somewhere else, and then, oh, fuck, I don't have that container anymore to do forensics there. How we can handle all that? Well, attacks are usually multiple steps, and in containers, because they are this dynamic, they are most of the times automated. It's a script. It's not someone trying to hack. You know, uh, he has automated all those steps. And typically, uh, when we have a successful attack in our infrastructure, is because we couldn't identify the steps of those attacks. But probably there is going to be in the small detail that is going to slip between uh, 
uh, the lines to the attacker, there's going to be small something that we can detect and we can correlate into an attack. And this is what we are going to use to identify these attacks. There are a few things, a few different technologies for um, isolating or establishing uh, security policies. SecCom, it's uh, one of the most popular ones uh, because at the same time it's super simple but it's quite limited. The idea is that, is that we can build a wide list of system calls. We can create like a sandbox. There is a, a one-way process uh, of getting a process into that sandbox stage or a status where it can only execute 13 system calls. If it tries to execute another system call, basically it will be killed. So this is quite convenient to limit what the processes can do inside the container. There are some things that definitely a container is not going to do. It's not going to create a new uh, process namespace. It's not going to reboot the host. It's not going to try to change the namespace. So this is definitely useful because there are some things that we can say from the very beginning a process in a container won't do. So you should use uh, second profiles. But uh, the, the features or the what uh, SecCom provides is quite limited. It allows you to whitelist or blacklist those system calls, but it has no context. For example, imagine you want to uh, block chmod system call, but you might say, okay, chmod on a slash etc, it's forbidden because it, mm, the process shouldn't make any configuration change, but maybe the init script makes some chmod in the slash bar slash lib, I don't know, some dynamic uh, uh, path for, for storing data. So we need more advanced uh, systems to, to define what the processes can do. So Linux and Apple Armor are good examples. They also work at the kernel level. They have more features, but at the same time, they are more complex. It's famous how Cell Linux, it's uh, sometimes quite difficult to use. Uh, their entry barrier is quite high. Um, it has some higher level concepts, like Processes, you can define a process that you in, in SecCom you cannot do. You can define actions like reading a file, writing a file. Uh, same thing with uh, sockets, uh, file descriptors at the end. And even targets, you can define a path of a file name or the IP address of a socket. So you have those uh, capabilities to write more advanced rules. But still, we lack something very important we lack the possibility to bring in uh, the orchestration metadata into that ruling. So this is one of the reasons why, uh, from the Cystic technology, we created Falco. We took the same technology of being able to look at the system calls, to work to have a filtering language of the system calls, and instead of using that for troubleshooting, we decided to use it for uh, security or process activity monitoring. The basic idea, the idea is that we use a similar to TCP dump filtering language, but you can bring in uh, Kubernetes and container uh, labels to define your policies. To give you a few examples of things you can do is, okay, if someone runs a shell in a container, so send a notification, so you see Container ID is not a host, and the process name is this. Um, there are a few examples, but the idea is use, rather than using system calls or using SE Linux syntax, which is very low level, using a more natural language uh, ruling. I'm going to give you a real example of a useful rule. Imagine you have uh, a pod that needs to read a secret. Usually, that happens at the start time of the container. And because that process will be in memory, that process probably doesn't need to read that secret never again. What happens if you detect that, I don't know, more than 15 seconds after starting that container, after starting that process, the code in, inside that container starts to read that secret again? There is probably something very suspicious there. So this is how we can configure a Falco rule to define if, uh, or to trigger a notification if a secret does something like that. So 
This is five seconds, I believe, and then we say, okay, if there is a process that reads a file in slash etc secrets and it does a read and the process has been running for more than five seconds, trigger a notification. This is the idea of using code again that you can put inside your uh, re code repository to define rules like this. In the same way that your developers, they write the code and then they write the alerts for those services and they put all together, they should be writing uh, rules about how the process, how the code they are developing is going to behave. So, okay, we have gone through, through the entire um, CICD CS process but still many people are missing the last part. What do you do as an incident response? Um, some time ago, I used, to, I used to talk about human ops, about on-call, about how to, how to do war games and practice for something failing in your infrastructure, uh, like using checklists, um, using uh, run books to respond to all this. But uh, there is a technical implication of using containers with incident response, with post-mortem analysis and forensics, which is what I mentioned before. Might be uh, the situation that the container doesn't exist anymore. How we can answer what happened, where it happened, who did it, why? We might have only logs. Uh, even if we have logs, even if the container exists, SSH into a production host and starting to do Docker exec and installing tools inside that container, it doesn't look like a good idea. So why don't we look at what we have been doing previously? In the past, when we had to do a very low level analysis of what happened, we used to take a capture file of the network packets. If we try to look at the past and we and try to find something similar to microservices, something complex with different entities talking to each other, uh, might be different servers talking to each other over the network. And when we had to troubleshoot a server talking to each other and something going funny, something not working, what we used to do? Uh, start TCP dump or start Wireshark, take a capture and start looking at the protocol and if the protocol wasn't giving me enough information, uh, going down into TCP or even IP protocols layers. So why don't we do the same thing uh, with the entire system? So that's why at Sysdic we created uh, Sysdic Inspect in addition to Sysdic Falco. And this is something I want to show you quickly how we can do uh, a post-mortem analysis of an attack in a container. Um, I, didn't want to, I didn't want to do this entire presentation without a demo. It's, I love doing demos. And this is a quite impressive use case for, for this technology that we think it should be part of your CID, CID, CS process. The idea is when you have an incident, you can respond to that incident uh, that security incident, taking automatically this is the capture, storing all the container information in a file, in a format similar to a pickup file, but with all the system calls. And we have built this UI, which is open source. You can go into GitHub, uh, Dryos, which is our, our organization name, says they inspect and download it. The idea here is that you can correlate high-level activities down to all the individual system calls. So, for example, here, this is a, ping, a stupid ping application, okay? It's an application that I can log in and then allows me to ping an IP address. But I believe I've been hacked. So um, I can pull in, down into this timeline, different activities. I have not click in here and I can see all the different HTTP requests I have been uh, requested during this capture time. And I know that my application runs ping underneath, so I can pull in the commands. So I see the commands that are aligned with the different HTTP requests, which sounds good. I can use these sliders to narrow my search <coughs> around a specific time frame, and I can isolate uh, my search. I can drill down in any of these boxes, 
and see the commands. And as, I, as soon as I see the commands, I see something super suspicious. So I see my ping, but then I see a cut of my PHP file. This is super suspicious. Something must, uh, must be happening here. So I can go back and, for example, look at the HTTP requests. So I see the get. OK, cool. But then mm, at the end of the get, I see like something not expected. This is suspicious. This is suspicious. What if I try to look at the raw uh, traffic of HTTP? OK, let's try to decode the text on the connection. As soon as I see all the headers and the, the, the content of my post request, I see something suspicious here. OK, the name, the user, and then I can see something funny here. I see that someone is doing a typical SQL injection to bypass my authentication. And then I see that the content of the field of the IP address, it's not the local host, but he is doing a common injection. So from the system calls capture, I'm able to decode uh, this information. But I can go further and say, OK, I would like to know. So I, I know how I've been hacked, but I can, I can do more things. So, OK, this person, I could go and, uh, and analyze each of the requests. But then I see like a special pattern here at the end. So there was a request, a command, not expected, and then without a request, and then requests without commands. So I see the command, and I see a curl. So hmm, I have, I'm suspicious this person has downloaded a rootkit or something. I can isolate this process and look at the files it wrote. And I can try to find the file it wrote, dump PHP. Hmm. I can go and even look at the content <laughs> of the rootkit, of the file, of the data exfiltration script the, hacker, the attacker uh, downloaded into my server. So I see that he's basically downloaded a piece of code that it's connecting into my employee's database, and it's doing a dump. OK, so I can go back and even see other requests that he executed later. And I can see how he ran that specific script and got access to the entire database. OK, so this is just an example of the powerful of all the system calls and why it's very convenient to, to keep them to do this post-mortem analysis. Uh, a demo of the last stage, the last part of your CICD pipeline. So I hope you like it. This is everything I have for today. We have five more minutes. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to answer it. Uh, this Syslic inspect uh, run as a container in a pod, or it's run as on the host machines where my Kubernetes worker nodes are running? Inspect is just a UI. You can run it directly, or you should run it directly on your laptop. It's an Electron UI for Linux, for Mac, and I think we have published recently a Windows version. How you take that capture file, you do it with a Syslic open source tool, okay. and that can be run in a container you can run that using a, a diamond set, okay. even if you want. OK. And you mentioned that we need to uh, implement some Kubernetes uh, security policies. Mm -hmm. uh, there are options of using SC Linux, AppArmor, or SECCOM. Uh, what is recommended? Should we be implementing all of them, or should we choose one of them and implement it? This is security. This is layers on top of each other. So um, to be honest, uh, I think SecComp it's a good start uh, because it's going to very easily allow you to block those system calls that you know for sure you shouldn't be executing. Then probably you need to decide if you want to use Selinux, Aparmor, 
or something more container native like Falco or some commercial tools that you have for uh, runtime uh, security. So probably you need to pick two. It's a, it's a good combination. Out of SC Linux and App Armor we can use. Sorry, say that again? Out of SC Linux and App Armor we can choose. Yeah, you can use App Armor, so Linux, you can use Falco, you can use Sysdig Secure, which is our commercial tool. Uh, there are a few tools that they have different capabilities, so you should look what's more convenient for you. I think we have another question here in the front. Um, can you tell me how much resu resources are needed for that uh, capturing this uh, cystic inspect? So typically, so let me split that in two parts. Typically, uh, the kernel level uh, security measures, they have a very little performance impact. I don't have the numbers uh, for Selinux or Aparmor. I do for Sysdic. And here you need to identify uh, two parts. The kernel or the system call interception. That has a performance impact in a small latency of less than 10 nanoseconds. So basically, you can ignore that part. Then you have another part, which is the processing. Okay, So decoding that high-level language into a collection of system calls happening in a specific timeline. You know, for example, when I was giving that example of a process which is older than five seconds, which is opening for reading a file in a slash etc secrets. The, we have built that uh, translation engine from that high level into system calls to be quite efficient. We see that typically goes around 1% CPU in production business servers. So it's, it's uh, quite good for for the value it provides. Then there is another performance uh, area that we should take into account, which is taking that capture file, dumping into a file all the system calls. You don't do that all the time because it would be impossible. Uh, dumping all the system calls into, into a file, basically you would need to double your infrastructure at least. Um, so you only do that when you recognize that there is an incident. And the, the, you can apply some capture filters. So you, instead of including all the information from all the hosts, you can only, include, you only capture the system calls that they are coming from a specific container or they are coming from a specific namespace if you believe the, that that specific attack could have spread into other pods, other containers inside the same namespace or application. And that has a performance impact in terms of I.O. Because those files, the busier your server is, the bigger they grow. So you need to have, or you need to do a trade-off between the longer that capture file is, the busier, or how busy are your servers, and how uh, much high you can handle. We see that in production servers, uh, obviously it really depends, uh, but a few seconds can be in the order of 10 or 100 megabytes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>